David Tennant's final Doctor Who story hitting our screens, let's journey back to his other final Doctor Who story. The End of Time has some of the craziest and most heartfelt moments in Doctor Who. It's a story that really felt like the end of an era, and there's never been a better time for a deep dive. So let's get cracking. I'm Ellie for Who Culture here with 20 things you didn't know about the end of time. Number 20, The Regeneration That Never Was The End of Time was the swan song for the much-loved 10th Doctor. After saving good old Will from a radiation booth, Ten embarks on a goodbye tour for the ages, before regenerating into Matt Smith's 11th Doctor in a blaze of glory. However, it could have been very different. Russell T Davis originally wanted Ten's goodbye to be a subtle affair, where the Doctor would die rescuing a seemingly unremarkable alien family. He liked the idea that the great Time Lord was so no that he would sacrifice himself to save a group of ordinary people. This was changed for two reasons. Davis was worried that such a simple story wouldn't play well over two hours, and that audiences would be disappointed to see a beloved character go out in such low-stakes circumstances. And he was probably right. Number 19. Heath Ledger inspired John Sim after a beautifully unhinged performance as the Doctor's nemesis in Series 3, John Sim turned the crazy dial up to 11 for his second stint as the Master. Zapping people with force lightning and chowing down on some burgers slash turkey slash homeless people, Sim's manic energy fit the character perfectly, and perhaps one of the reasons it was so good was that he took cues from a Hollywood heavyweight. Sim was inspired by elements of Heath Ledger's Joker from The Dark Knight, which had come out the year before. It was also his idea to dye his hair blonde to indicate something had gone wrong with his resurrection. Now imagine if it had been the other way round and Ledger had requested a scene where the Joker danced to Voodoo Child. I'd watch that. Number 18, RTD and Matt Smith's awkward first meeting. With one doctor out of the way, a new one was needed to take his place. Enter adorable man-boy Matt Smith, whose first scene as the 11th Doctor was in The End of Time Part 2. This means that Smith actually spent some time with Russell T Davis during the shoot, which is kind of weird to think about, isn't it? Since Smith is so intrinsically tied to Stephen Moffat. As the new Doctor arrived to film his first scene, everyone had been cleared out of the TARDIS set to ease the pressure on him. Unfortunately, this meant that everyone was now stood outside, and Smith had to wade through them all to get to set. Among them was RTD, who wanted to stay out of Smith's way and let him get on with it. However, Smith spotted Davis right as he was turning around to avoid him. Ooh, awkward. Number 17, the Doctor almost met Trinity Wells. Oh, good old Trinity Wells. You know what, at this point, I feel like Who Culture is basically just a Trinity Wells fan account. One of the most consistent parts of RTD's first stint as showrunner was a familiar American newsreader who cropped up whenever there was a big incident to report on. Trinity Wells appeared in several 9th and 10th Doctor stories, covering events like the spaceship in the Thames, the Sycorax invasion, and the Atmos crisis. She was the calming voice of reason within the madness, and she was almost a lot more than just a face on a screen. The idea was floated that the Doctor would finally meet Wells in the ruins of Broadfell Prison, mainly because Davis wanted to give her a bigger role. Eventually, this was deemed unnecessary and a bit self-indulgent, so AMNN's biggest star was reduced to her usual cameo spot instead. But we're still holding out a sneaky bit of hope that we may well see Trinity Wells again in the upcoming weeks. Number 16, Moffat shot down the Daleks. Of the four regular series finales Davis oversaw, three of them involved the Daleks as one of the main villains. It stands to reason that he would want to include the diabolical dustbins in his final crescendo, but he didn't count on one thing, the intervention of a middle-aged Scotsman. Davis originally wanted the returning Time Lords to team up with their greatest foes to show just how far they'd fallen, but new showrunner Stephen Moffat was having none of it. Moffat asked Davis not to include the Daleks as he wanted their appearance in Victory of the Daleks to feel as fresh as possible. Not wanting to undermine his successor, RTD removed them from the story. Oh, what a nice chap he is. Number 15, the crew tripped Tennant for one final surprise. After filming his dizzying skydive, David Tennant was officially done as the 10th Doctor. Or so he thought. Because he's an all-round diamond geezer, the crew wanted to do something special to mark Tennant's departure. So they called him back onto set after his final shot, under the pretense that they needed him for a final lighting reference. Tennant knew this was a load of rubbish, but he went along with it anyway. Back on set, the crew threw their star one last surprise, sending him off with a round of applause and a blast of confetti so big it could have stunned an Azorbaloff from 20 paces. Cue a very emotional tenant telling everyone how proud he was to have worked on the show and thanking them all for their hard work. 
I'm not crying, you're crying. Number 14, The Alternate Titles. The End of Time is such a perfect name for a Doctor Who story that it's amazing to think it hadn't already been done. It's a grand statement befitting such a monumental finale and has many different interpretations. Is it the end of the Doctor's time? The end of the Time War? The end of time as a concept? It's genius! Originally, however, Davis wanted the title to be The Immortality Gate, in reference to the device at the centre of the action. Other potential names included The Final Days of Planet Earth, which is pretty good to be honest, The Final Battle, eh, a bit bland, The Final Reckoning, eh, also bland, and Death of the Doctor, which is just way too literal. Although he did get to use that particular title later when he penned the Sarah Jane Adventures story of the same name, and somehow that wasn't so literal. Number 13, Cribbin's own life inspired a monologue. How dare Bernard Cribbin's lure us all into a false sense of security with decades of novelty songs and bedtime stories, only to drop one of the finest dramatic performances in British TV at the age of 80. Wilfred Mott's heart-wrenching conversation with the Doctor aboard the Vinvochi ship is preceded by him reminiscing about his time in the army. He talks about his time in service in 1948 and about dodging a blizzard of bullets during a skirmish. Perhaps the reason Cribbins was able to deliver this monologue so well was because he wasn't acting, he was remembering. The blizzard of bullets he describes was an actual blizzard he endured while serving in real life, one of many extraordinary moments from his extraordinary history. Oh, I miss Bernard Cribbins. Number 12, June Whitfield really enjoyed her scenes. The group of pensioners known as the Silver Cloak is instrumental in uniting Ten with his final companion. One of the more memorable members of the gang is Minnie the Menace Hooper, played by the delightful June Whitfield. When the Silver Cloak gathers round the Doctor for a photo, she senses an opportunity and grabs Ten's bum, eliciting some great comedic delivery from David Tennant. Whitfield really went for it in this scene. Producer Julie Gardner described her approach as very method, while director Euros Lin said that they had to stop her getting carried away as she wanted two big handfuls of that Time Lord booty. Don't lie, if you had the chance to get a slice of Gallifrey's finest cake, then you do the exact same thing. Number 11, it was almost a body swap story. Freaky Friday, 13 going on 30, the first live-action Scooby-Doo movie, oh what a film. These cinematic classics have one thing in common, people swapping bodies. The End of Time nearly joined that list, as one of the initial ideas was to have the Doctor and the Master swap bodies, presumably so the evil Time Lord could do something nefarious like scribble over the Doctor's clothes in marker pen. What a fiend. This wacky notion was scrapped when RTD realised it would involve John Sim playing the Doctor and David Tennant playing the Master, and he didn't want Tennant playing any other character during his big farewell. Also, it might have come across like a redux of New Earth, where Cassandra hops from body to body, and nobody needed to see the Doctor beating out a Samba again. Number 10, Tennant wrapped on a fitting slate number. As much as we'd all like to believe that TV shows are filmed in the order that we see them in, it's actually one big jumbled mess behind the scenes. As mentioned, the final scene involving David Tennant was him falling through the air, ready to crash through the glass roof of Naismith's mansion. On the clapperboard for this scene, the slate number, which changes every time there's a new setup, was 999. The phone number you call in the UK if you need a fire engine, a police car, or a doctor. You couldn't make it up. Could you? Number 9, Return of the Zogs. When Russell T. Davis was working on Doctor Who's return to television, he made sure to outline one very important point in his pitch. He wanted to make the show more human, more relatable, and less about the random goings on in some galaxy far, far away. Or, as he so eloquently put it, if the Zogs on Planet Zog are having trouble with the Zog monster, who gives a toss? Little did he know that several years later those words would return to him in an unlikely way. The scene where the Doctor visits Captain Jack Harkness takes place in the wonderful named Zagat Zagoo Bar, which is located on the planet Zog. Yep, in the final script of his first tenure, Davis made an incredibly inside baseball reference to where it all began. Number 8, John Sim's significant credit. Alongside all the standout work from David Tennant and Bernard Cribbins, it's easy to forget that The End of Time contains another knockout performance from John Sim. Sim was brought back for one last go around as the Doctor's unhinged arch enemy, well, until he came back again in Series 10, but and due to his large role, his name appeared in the opening title sequence. This made him only the second person in Doctor Who history to appear in the titles for playing a villain, after Eric Roberts beat him to the punch in the 1996 TV movie. So not quite a gold medal for Sim, but it's still very impressive. You know who else's name never appeared in the opening credits until their last appearance? Alex 
Kingston. Why did River Song never appear in the opening credits? Jack Harkness did. John Barrowman's name appeared in the credits when he was in an episode. Why was Alex Kingston not? Ugh, it bugs me. Number seven, Verity's cameo was nearly cancelled. During the carousel of goodbyes the Doctor goes on before his regeneration, he stops off at a bookshop to pay a visit to someone very special. Verity Newman is the great-granddaughter of Joan Redfern, the nurse Ten fell in love with while disguised as a human in Series 3. Newman is played by Jessica Hines, who also played Joan, but her appearance almost didn't happen. Hines was in a Broadway play that coincided with proposed filming dates for the episode, but instead of cancelling her cameo, her scene was filmed long before anything else and was the very first thing taped for the end of time. Had Hines not been available, it was suggested to replace her with Elton Pope and Ursula Blake from Love and Monsters. Can you imagine how that would have gone down? Although I am curious as to whether she's still a paving slab. Number 6. It was almost broadcast on a single day. The second instalment of The End of Time did something that Doctor Who hadn't done since 1977, air on New Year's Day. The first instalment kept the New Who tradition of airing on Christmas Day, forcing fans to wait an agonising week for the conclusion. The stress at the time was unbearable. Said stress would have been alleviated had one of the original ideas gone ahead, which was to put out both episodes on Christmas Day. The BBC had previously done this with EastEnders, but this time around they weren't having it, and the Christmas slash New Year split was chosen instead. Davis was then forced to remove most of the Christmas-related references from Part 2, which makes you wonder if Rassilon was initially going to be wearing a Santa hat when he came through the portal. Number 5. Certain ideas weren't new With RTD believing the end of time was his final story in charge of Doctor Who, he took the opportunity to use some ideas he'd been holding on to for a while. The Hesperus dogfight sequence was borrowed from an early draft of Planet of the Dead, while the aforementioned Zagit Zagu scene, essentially Doctor Who's Moss Eisley cantina, was initially conceived for the Stolen Earth and Journey's End, as was the return of Russell Tovey's Alonzo. Meanwhile, the Doctor revealing to Sylvia that he bought Donna's lottery ticket with money borrowed from her late husband Jeff was a tribute to actor Howard Atfield, who was supposed to return in Series 4, but passed away at the start of production. Number 4. Matt Smith does what to the TARDIS console? Back to the Smithster and his first steps into the role of the Doctor as the newly regenerated Eleven attempts to stop the TARDIS from crashing. Spoiler alert, he fails and ends up bumping into young Amelia Pond's garden. While he's flailing away at the TARDIS's console, eagle-eyed viewers might be able to spot that he randomly spits on his so-called wife during the mayhem. First of all, why? And second of all, why? Well, it turns out there's quite a valid reason. As the TARDIS set crumbled around him, some of that debris managed to get into Smith's mouth. He was simply getting rid of it, which the cameras managed to catch. And hey, his taste buds were new, he didn't know if he liked TARDIS debris yet. Number 3. Donna's role was originally smaller Though Wilfred Mott serves as the companion for these episodes, Catherine Tate's Donna Noble also makes a sizeable appearance. Tate was initially penciled in for a minor cameo during the epilogue, to show that Donna had managed to live a good life despite her tragic exit in Series 4. Her role was later expanded to include more dialogue and her confrontation with the Masters in the alleyway before she got her spot in the epilogue as intended. And that was the last time she ever appeared in Doctor Who, until it was revealed that she'd be appearing in the 60th anniversary specials. Turns out it wasn't Journey's End after all. Number 2. John Sims' insane number of costumes Prior to him realising he was merely a bleached blonde pawn in Rassilon's game, the Master was actually successful in his diabolical plan, which doesn't often happen for Doctor Who villains. So well done there, buddy. Gold star, or white point star, whatever. The idea of the Master race was certainly interesting on paper, but in practice it presented a gigantic headache for John Sim, who had to portray every single other version of himself. As well as his bedraggled, hoodie-wearing form, Sim had to play the master in suits, army uniforms, dresses, lab coats and more, which meant a monumental number of costume changes. According to producer Julie Gardner, Sim underwent 32 costume changes in the space of 4 hours, which is 8 per hour. He must have been absolutely knackered! No wonder he was half skeleton by the end. Number 1. Those final words were a long time coming. I don't want to go. With five words, David Tennant sent millions of people around the world into fits of uncontrollable sobbing as he bowed out of the role with incredible vulnerability. It was humbling to watch the almighty Doctor be reduced to such a state in his final moments, and this was an idea that Davis had been holding onto for a long, long time. Though the first draft of the Part 2 script was completed in March 2009, the writer had come up with the Tenth Doctor's final words 18 months 
months earlier during a scripting session for Partners in Crime in September 2007. Imagine sitting on an emotional landmine of that magnitude for so long, knowing the anguish it was going to cause when you finally set it off. He's going to devastate us in the 60th, isn't he? I don't think I'm ready. And that's everything for this list, but if you want to know more about other episodes, then why not check out 20 Things You Didn't Know About the Waters of Mars. In the meantime, I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye, sweeties.